بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد today إن شاء الله we will finish the story of Abu Bakr al Siddiq رضي الله تعالى عن and by the way so we had the tragedy of this young boy we had this tragedy as well in our our masjid somebody passed away and today's lecture half of it deals with the death of Abu Bakr so can you imagine like you know it was just not I was just not in the positive mood to really do my, my general job. But nonetheless, inshallah, today we'll finish off with the story of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and we'll begin with a quick summary of the main uh, battles, the main battles that laid the foundations for the conquest of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Now, realize that the most important conquest of early Islam took place in the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab. These were the big battles that we're going to come to inshallah in a few weeks. But Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu laid the foundations. And Allah azza wa jal blessed him to begin the process. If he didn't begin the process, Umar ibn Khattab could not have gotten to the level that he did. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu simultaneously aimed for both of the superpowers. I mean, frankly, it is so audacious, so brave, so courageous. Some of the Sahaba even thought it was foolhardy. Remember when he was fighting the apostates, right? Some of the Sahaba even said, hold on, calm down, this is too much, too fast. But Abu Bakr as-Siddiq had that much tawakkul in Allah that he took on both of the superpowers simultaneously. And the Muslim Ummah is brand new. They've just formed. And he feels Allah will help us against the both of them. So he launches a dual offensive. On the one hand against the Sassanids, on the other hand against the Byzantine Romans, right? A dual offensive simultaneously in the 12th year of the Hijrah. And he barely has 10 months left to live. And honestly, if you sit back and think about it, it really is an act of tawakkul, courage, an act of bravery that this newly formed, literally baby ummah. The ummah is literally two years, a year and a half old. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu has that audacity. I'm going to take on both of these uh, superpowers. And so we'll begin with one of them and that is the Sassanids and move our way to the Romans and then talk about the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. That uh, after the uh, wars of Ridda, after the wars of Ridda, the, the, uh, against Musaylama al-Kadhab, one of the tribal chieftains who lived in the area what is now Bahrain, his name was Al-Muthanna ibn Al-Haritha. Al-Muthanna ibn Al-Haritha. He had converted to Islam and he launched an offensive into the Sassanid region. This was not commanded by Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Rather, this was his own initiative that he's going to launch an offensive into some of the Sassanid uh, towns. And these Sassanid towns are in what is now Iraq. Because Iraq and Iran were basically one large Sassanid empire. And so he launched his offensive into Iraq and he came back successful. And he made his way to Medina and he gave the percentage. So the rules were that a certain percentage goes to the Ummah. And the Ummah then, this is, uh, the Ummah then uses it for what it uh, needs to use it. This is one of the sources of income for the Ummah. And so he made his way to Medina and he reported the success of what he had done. Promptly, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq made him in charge of that region and said, now you're going to officially engage with the Sassanid Empire. So he flipped it around immediately and he said, from now on, you're going to go in deeper and engage with the Sassanid Empire. And he said, I will send Khalid ibn al-Walid in your direction as well with aid and with help. And Khalid was in central uh, Najd. Khalid was in Central Arabia, or sorry, I should say Upper Arabia, uh, battling Musaylama, Musaylama uh, the Kadhab from Yamama. And Yamama uh, is in basically what we now call Naj, which is like uh, above the Riyadh area. And so from Riyadh to the Bahrain area is relatively closer, much closer, half the distance is done. So Abu Bakr as Siddiq sent a letter to Khalid and Walid and said, Go immediately to Al Muthanna ibn al Haritha, join forces with him, and the both of you attack the Persians, attack the Sassanid Empire. And he said, Do not take any of the apostates who reconverted back to Islam. Any murtad who made tawbah, no, we can't trust these guys. Don't take a single one of them. And because realized they had all made tawbah, obviously, and they had now they're now new Muslims again. And Abu Bakr Siddiq said, no, we're not going to take any of them. And he also said, 
Don't take anybody who doesn't want to go. This is a voluntary expedition. I'm not commanding every soldier to go. Whereas the Musaylam al kadhabs expedition was mandatory. You had to go. Now this is a dangerous assignment and you have to now go much more than you had initially enlisted. And so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq made it a voluntary assignment. Nonetheless, the bulk of those who were there, they uh, continued onwards. And therefore, in Muharram of the 12th year, of the Hijrah, Muharram of the 12th year of the Hijrah, Khalid ibn al-Walid left Yamama with around 10,000 men. And he made his way to Al-Muthanna ibn al-Haritha, and Al-Muthanna had cobbled together from the various tribes over there another six, seven, eight thousand. So at max, 18,000 people decided to take on one of the most ancient civilizations of the world, one of the most powerful civilizations of the world, and that is the Persian Sassanid Empire. 18,000 is what? Compared to hundreds of thousands of troops, compared to a civilization whose glory went back seven centuries. I mean, if you think again of the, 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 the audacity, if you think again of the, the, the di- dynamics involved, wallahi, it is truly mind-boggling. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said to Khalid and Walid that I want you to conquer the primary city in that region of what is now Iraq. Uh, it wasn't called Iraq by then, of now it is called Iraq. And the primary city of that region, which is the stepping stone into the Sassan Empire, was called Al-Hira. Al-Hira. Now, Al-Hira, most of you here would not have heard of it, but m- all of you know of the city that was built because of Al-Hira. Pause here, what am I talking about? Fast forward. So, Umar ibn al-Khattab in his Khilafah decided that we were not going to allow Muslims to settle in conquered cities because they will then be corrupted by what? Money. They'll be corrupted by the wealth. They'll be corrupted by... So Muslims would camp outside the city. They were going to build mini encampments. And the Muslims will rule from outside the city. Because the inhabitants will remain where they are. Now we're fast forwarding. This isn't Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. This is Umar al-Khattab. And one of the earliest cities that was built was built outside of Al-Hira. Now what happened was these small cities of Muslims who were controlling the city, what's going to happen? More and more people migrate to that city. And the city grows, grows, grows until it envelopes the old city. Until the new city eclipses the old city. And this happened across the Muslim world. Um, Al-Qahira. What is Al-Qahira? It was the city of Fustat. And they went and they made a little city, Al-Qahira, outside of it. Until finally, Al-Qahira becomes, was it now the third largest city in the world or something like that? right? So Al-Hira, the city that they built was called, or they called it, Kufa. Kufa. So Kufa was the city that enveloped Al-Hira. But Al-Hira was the civilization of the city before Kufa came onto the scene. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq says to Khalid and Walid, concentrate on Al-Hira and you're going to capture uh, Al-Hira. And so uh, these 18,000 men, uh, they ended up uh, attacking the Sassanid Empire, and a series of battles took place. We're not going to go into each one of them. This is where, as I said in my disclaimer a few weeks ago, we will not go into the level of detail we did for the Seerah. This is a whole different class about every battle has a chart and whatnot. I mean, this is, I think, I would lose uh, you and it wouldn't be of that much interest. Just overall, uh, the, the main thing we should know is around four or five battles took place. Perhaps the most significant of them was called Thatu Salasil. Thatu Salasil. And this is also the name of an expedition in the lifetime of the Prophet. ﷺ. And when I said that one, I said this should not be confused with the Thatu Salasil of Khalid bin Walid. And now we get to this Thatu Salasil of Khalid bin Walid. Thatu Salasil means the battle of the chains. Why was it called the battle of the chains? Because the Persians, the Sassanids, Uh, one of their tactics was that they'd have the soldiers linked by chains. Their soldiers linked by chains. And imagine you have 50,000 soldiers linked by chains. You're talking about a formidable arsenal. This was a tactic, a weaponry tactic that the Persians used. It was very successful because they had stronger equipment, stronger, better trained men. And now you have these solid chains. And initially, it seemed as if that would work against the Muslims. Uh, Long story short, basically, there was a change in weather. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course blessed of course from our perspective a karama took place and the entire system of chains turned against the Persians and that actually ended up acting like a barrier for them to flee and run and so the Muslims managed to inflict a massive blow on the uh, Persians and this caused the Persians to basically be slaughtered or taken prisoner en masse. As well, other mini battles took place, the Battle of Al-Madhar, the Battle of Al-Jawla, and others. And the main point is eventually Khalid ibn al-Walid makes his way to the city of Al-Hira, and he surrounds them and he gives them the three conditions that we are all familiar with. The first condition, accept Islam, you be with us, we be with you, we become one. The second condition, give us jizya, and you be as you are, and we'll let you be, and we will basically protect you and rule over you. And the third condition, you don't agree with either of these two, will go to war. And remember that you are fighting a group who loves death more than you love life. This is what Khalid and Walid said to them. And the people of Al-Hira readily agreed to pay the jizya and accepted the terms of jizya. Now, why would people readily agree to pay the jizya? So, you have to realize that back in the day, this whole concept of loyalty to your your nation or your civilization was not that big of a deal. People swapped all the time. And what they really wanted was security. And what they really wanted, which is what all human beings always want, is low taxes. Okay. So when the Persians were overtaxing them and not really giving them that much in return, so a lot of these cities were more than willing to go with the jizya because the jizya actually represented much less taxes than the Persians had on them. And in return, they were promised, as you know, freedom of religion. They were promised military protection. And they were allowed to judge their own affairs. See, the Islamic system was very different and unique. You have your own judges. Don't get us involved. You have your disputes. You have your own laws that you have. We're allowing you your own laws. Now, eventually, as those civilizations converted to Islam, obviously, Islam became a part and parcel of the Islamic law. But right in the beginning, they were told, your business, you take charge of your municipal affairs and you give us the jizya and even the Muslims weren't even allowed to live inside the city. So imagine the freedom that they had, that their conquerors are not even mixing with them. They're, you go ahead in your daily life and we have our cities outside. So in fact, the people of Hira uh, enthusiastically accepted the jizya. And of course, as I mentioned, was it two weeks ago, about some of the wisdoms of, of jihad. Remember one of the things we said was what? To spread Islam. And this is exactly what happened. That when Islamic civilization was shown to them, when they interacted with the Muslims, slowly but surely, what happened to Kufa? It's an entirely Muslim city now, right? Where are the people who were the Zoroastrians? I don't think there are any Zoroastrians anymore left in Kufa. Even though when it was conquered, it was a city of Zoroastrians, a city of Jews, a city of Christians. They're all gone now. Slowly but surely, those conversions took place. So the result of all of these battles, to be in a nutshell before we move on to, to Syria, the result of these battles in the reign of Abu Bakr, in the reign of Abu Bakr, as-Siddiq radiallahu an, the entire lands of what is now basically called Iraq, the entire lands of Iraq were conquered. But the big prize is not going to come now. That's going to come in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And that is the capital of the Sassanids. The capital of the Sassanids, of course, is, is what? No, 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 no. The what? Tesiphon, yes, Madain, very good. The Arabs called it Madain. In English, it's called Tesiphon. And uh, Madain is basically outside of Tehran modern Tehran, like an, I don't know, half an hour's drive or something like that, but the, the city of Madain or Tesiphon uh, th is the capital, and as I mentioned many times, it is one of the wonders of the world. To this day, you have these massive beams that just seem to just come out of nowhere, and they go all the way up into the, uh, and, and the, the structures of the palaces, they're still there to this day. Now that's going to come in the reign of Umar bin Khattab. The conquering of actual Kisra and whatnot, that will come in the reign of Umar ibn Khattab, and that's going to come in a few years. But now the foundation is laid, and that is the conquering of um, Iraq. And by the way, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that to this day, the destruction of the Sassanid Empire remains one of the most intriguing historical anomalies of that time. Historians, academics to this day are scratching their heads trying to figure out how could this have happened? How could a civilization that was 
at that time more powerful than the Romans even. Because remember, Alif Lam Mim, Ghulibatil Rum. The Romans have been defeated. And this was the same emperors that Allah is talking about. Heraclius on the one side, right? And Kisra on the other, the same emperors. And Allah says, Ghulibatil Rum. The Romans have been defeated. And Allah says, don't worry, tides are going to change. Not only did the tides change, the Sassanid civilization ceased to exist. Something the Romans could not do for 300 years. For 300 years, the Romans and the Persians are at each other's throats. And these are both, as we know, superpowers, empires. These are people that have at least a million soldiers on each side. These are civilizations that make their own weapons. The Arabs did not make their weapons. They imported them. They bought them. Right? These civilizations had their own weapons, their own techniques of war. The Arabs didn't have any of that. How could a group of 12,000 poorly equipped, underarmed, malnourished in some cases, right, without any training together, because even these are groups that don't have one training, different tactics of war. And to this day, as I said, and I was just reading up today on this as well, that there are so many theories how this could have happened. And the predominant theory is that there was a combination of factors that just coincidentally all came together. Now some of those factors might be very true. So they talk about that there was internal problems within the royal family. So that's why there wasn't that much support when things were happening. They talk about a certain general who became, uh, who became power hungry and he didn't want to help another general who needed the help, for example. But of course, from our perspective, this is what? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using the asbab, musabbib al-asbab, right? I mean, how else do you think a miracle is going to happen? You're going to find, just like with the Aws and Khazraj we talked about in the days of Medina, where Aisha said, Allah gifted the Prophet with their civil war. Or else they would never have called him from Mecca. Right? Remember back in the day we talked about. These theories, really one wonders, I mean, what is more logical and reasonable? That our Prophet wasallam predicted in his lifetime that as he tore my letter up, Allah will tear his kingdom up. He predicted in his lifetime that this is Kisra and there is no Kisra after him. He said in his own lifetime, there will not be another Kisra after this one. What a prediction to make of a civilization that goes back 700 years. Amazing prediction. And that's exactly what happened. And as I said, this is one of the weirdest anomalies of medieval history that is impossible to rationally explain. And as I said, you can read this up yourself and there are theories still to this day being uh, propagated. And especially when you look at 12,000 people, that's it. Coming out of Arabia and they destroy in the span of four or five years a civilization that goes back, as I said. In any case, this was the first blow and it was the most important one to open the door. Things are going to pause in Sassanid empires until Umar ibn Khattab. But in Abu Bakr's reign, what happened? What is now Iraq comes under Islamic rule. Now Khalid was going to go on. He wanted to move on to Tesiphon, to Madain. But he got a letter from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And that was, Oh Khalid, we need your help in Sham. We need your help in Syria. They're desperate for needs. And the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire has thrown all their forces against our army. And so as soon as you get this letter, you have Hira, Alhamdulillah, put somebody in charge. Now go and help the Muslims in Asham. And it is just amazing. Khalid and Wali is like a yo-yo between the Romans and the Persians, back and forth. Not a yo-yo, a bulldozer. Not a yo-yo, a bulldozer, right? One destruction there, another destruction here. Then he's going to go back and destroy that again. Just truly, Sayfullah al-Maslul. Literally, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the unsheathed sword of Allah. And these are, again, legacies and histories you just read about. And it's difficult to believe it actually happened. But then, as I said, these are well-known histories. Even the non-Muslims acknowledge that the Arabs had these amazing, the Muslims had these amazing successes. So, let's now go back a few months and talk about Syria. Okay, because we talked about Iraq. Now let's go back to, again, Muharram of the 12th year. These took three, four months in Syria. Now let's go back to the Muharram of the 12th year and talk about uh, Syria. Syria, of course, Bilad al-Sham, had been under Roman rule for probably around six centuries by now. 
more than six centuries, okay? Syria had been under Roman rule for more than uh, six centuries. The Persians had come in a few times, but overall it was a bastion of Roman uh, dominance. And again, Bilad the Sham, Jerusalem, uh, these all go back to, again, think of Jesus Christ and under the Romans. So the Romans are literally, this is their main, one of their main territories. It's not their capital, but it was considered to be one of their economic capitals. In fact, the economic capital. Because Syria basically falls under the trade road. road okay? So it was one of their most important economic uh, centers. And it was the first land that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq sent an army towards. And Muthanna was not planned. The first land that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq sent an army towards was not Iraq. That came after a while. The first was Syria. And why was it Syria? Why was his eyes on the prize? Because the Prophet ﷺ had sent Usama, Battle of Tabuk, because Jerusalem is Bayt al-Muqaddas, because it is the third holy, because it is Ard al barakna fiha, because he knew this is what the Prophet would want. So Syria was on his mind from day one. And literally at the death of Musaylama, as soon as that issue is resolved, the next thing he does is he sends forth an army from Medina up to Syria. So the army of Iraq was not sent from Medina. The army of Iraq was Khalid going up and then Muthanna who lived in that region anyway. Okay? The army of Syria was composed of most of the Sahaba from Medina. This was Abu Bakr's main target to send up north to Syria. And he followed the exact same route to Tabuk. Deja vu. There is a reason why Tabuk took place. We talked about that when we said Tabuk. And one of the main reasons was this. That the Prophet is showing Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So it was from Tabuk that the armies were launched against Syria. It was from the very place that the Prophet had basically gone up to. From Tabuk. What, that the armies against the Syrian, uh, the Roman Empire were uh, launched. And therefore Abu Bakr as-Siddiq uh, set forth, if you like, in motion a series of events that would eventually, and this is really, I started with Iraq because now we want to concentrate on Syria, otherwise chronolog chronologically this comes first. This expedition that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq sent to Tabuk marks the beginning of Islamic conquests. This one. At the end of the 11th year, the beginning of the 12th year. This expedition that he's sending a group of Sahaba, uh, Amr ibn al-As is in this group, and Yazid uh, ibn Abi Sufyan, not Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, who's the uncle of Yazid. Right? Not the Yazid of the Umayyads. This is the Yazid who is the older brother of Muawiyah. Okay? Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, uh, Shurahbil ibn Hassana, and Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn al-Jarrah, and many of the other Sahaba, they are the ones in this uh, contingent, in this unit. And this is considered to be the beginning of Islamic conquests. And this was the first domino of what was to eventually become the largest civilization in the history of humanity that was sustained and, and continued for a good period of time. Perhaps Alexander the Great conquered larger territories than is Muslims did. But how long did that last? As soon as he died, Khalas had finished. The largest contingent, uh, contiguous land mass that was controlled by any one civilization was that of the early Islamic Khilafah. The late Umayyads and then especially in the time of the Abbasids, literally from North Africa and Andalusia, right, all the way up until parts of China. That's the spectrum of the Khilafah. The first domino was this expedition. So it's very historic that this is where it begins. And uh, this is also in this jihad, in this offensive jihad, and yes, as, as we said last time, this is clearly offensive. The Romans did not present a threat to Medina. The Romans were not attacking Medina. They couldn't care less about Medina. But the Muslims definitely presented a threat to the Romans. And this was the famous expedition where Abu Bakr al-Siddiq gave his beautiful khutbah or summary which all of us have read, which we have uh, you know, seen quoted so many times. This was, this is especially significant in light of the fact that this is the first jihad. In light of the fact this is the first 
legitimate offensive jihad and this is the advice of the first khalifa to the first group of mujahideen right and this is a famous um, khutbah and um, it translates as uh, be gentle on yourself and on your army do not be harsh with your men or your officers and consult them in all of your affairs so he's advising uh, i forgot to mention who is the amir abu ubaida amir ibn al-jarrah the Amir is Abu Ubaida Amir ibn al-Jarrah, one of the greatest of the Sahaba. And when we get to eventually the lives of the Sahaba, he will have an entire uh, halaqa dedicated to him. He is definitely one of the uh, most famous. Abu Ubaida Amir ibn al-Jarrah is one of the most famous of the Sahaba, known for his bravery, his courage. He's participated in so many ghazawat. And he is put in charge of the uh, Roman expedition. And he tells Abu Ubaida Amir al-Jarrah that be just. Avoid evil and tyranny and realize that no nation that is unjust ever prospers and no group that does dhulm ever has victory over its enemies. Now this is very important in light of all of these jihadist movements and ISIS and whatnot. Every single line contradicts what these guys are doing. Literally, every single line contradicts the methodology of this modern movement. What does Abu Bakr say? Don't do dhulm. Because Allah will never cause the zalim to win over the, uh, the enemy. When you meet the enemy, do not turn your back and flee. For whoever does so earns the wrath of Allah unless he is running to another strategic point. Okay, so this is Quranic ayah that don't turn your back and run away. That this is a part of and the Prophet said when you meet the enemy, stand firm where you are. And when you have won victory over your enemies, do not kill their women or their children. Do not kill their elderly. And do not slaughter even their animals unless you do so to eat them. Eat means you use If you have to eat, then slaughter the animals. Otherwise, their property, their lands, don't harm them for no reason. Don't do that for any reason. And never break any promises you have made with your conquered people. Whatever you promise them, you have to live up to those conditions, right? Because once you promise, then you become in power. Who's gonna, who's gonna judge against you? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq tells them, any conditions you place, you had better live up to those uh, conditions. And he says to them, you will come across a people who are hermits in their monasteries. They worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They believe that they have given everything up for Allah. Let them be and do not destroy their places of worship. Look at how contrast now what's happening right now as we speak, right? Places of worship are being destroyed. Ancient civilizational ruins are being, for no reason, just being gotten rid of. Contrast this with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Okay? Do not destroy their temples and leave their holy people alone. We don't agree with their theology, but why are you going to destroy them? That's between them and Allah. Let them be. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq says, do not kill any of their uh, hermits. And uh, he says, you will meet other people uh, who are worshippers of the cross, meaning the Christians, and they are going to fight you. So for them, fight them back with your swords. So don't treat warriors like you're going to treat hermits. When you meet the enemy and they want to kill you for who you are, fight them until they submit to Islam or pay the jizya. That's where fighting becomes legitimate. Legitimate warriors who are going to fight you, go and fight them until they accept one of the two. And I entrust you with the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the advice of Abu Bakr. It's a very, uh, of course, the English ruins the entire beauty. If you read it in Arabic, it's a very eloquent uh, khutbah that he gave, that he gave while he was walking with Abu Ubaid Amin al-Jarrah. Abu Ubaid was on the, the, the animal, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was walking and giving him this advice. And Abu Ubaid felt embarrassed, but he insisted, and he gave him this beautiful uh, khutbah. And so Abu Ubaid made his way to... Uh, to uh, uh, the city of Tabuk, as we said, and from Tabuk, well, it wasn't a city back then. Back then, it was just a, uh, a, a well and a small encampment. It was basically not even a village. Now, of course, Tabuk is a, a, an entire massive city. Uh, he made his way to Tabuk, and then Abu Bakr Siddiq had told them a tactic that break up into four groups from Tabuk, and each one will go a different path. Each one will go a different path, and then meet up at the city of Basra, not Basra, 
Basra. And Basra was basically right outside of Damascus. It was the um, it was the city upon which the Silk Road ends. So the Silk Road, you all know the Silk Road? No? Hmm? The Chinese Silk Road, the Silk Road, right? So the end point of the Silk Road is basically Basra. Okay? And that's Basra is outside of Damascus by an hour's drive. So it's basically in the vicinity of Damascus. So he wanted them to, again, eventually get to Damascus and then eventually get to, of course, the big prize, Jerusalem. Okay? So city by city. So the initial city was Basra. And so he said from Tabuk, divide into four, each one goes a slightly different uh, path. And this is all Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's uh, uh, tactics. And so Amr ibn al-As was sent through what is now Palestine, what is now that land of Palestine. Uh, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan was sent directly to the side of Damascus. Shurahbil ibn Hassana went through what is now uh, Jordan. And the bulk Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn Jarrah, he made his way straight through the city of what is uh, Emisa, one of the ancient Roman cities, the city of Emisa. And he was, of course, the overall emir of the battle, Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn al-Jarrah. Now, the Roman emperor at the time is still Heraclius, the same guy from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is sad, but understood that he is not going to accept this attack. Why is it sad? Because he knew Islam was true. Remember? Because he accepted that the Prophet Sallallahu was a prophet. But he's a politician in the end of the day, and he has to do what politicians do. And therefore, Heraclius sent his own blood brother, Theodore, to be the leader of the army to attack the Muslims. To be the leader of the army to attack the uh, Muslims. And this is where a series of battles took place, where Abu Ubaidah realized that we are going to be defeated. We need help. We need serious help. So he immediately sends a letter to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq sends a letter to Khalid bin Walid and says, go meet Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn Jarrah, and then move on to uh, uh, Basra, and then move on to Damascus. This is when Khalid shifts gears from Persia to the Roman Empire. And uh, again, a number of battles take place, but one of them, one of the tactics that Khalid did was that when he was marching uh, back to help the Muslims in Syria, he decided that he would avoid the main highways. And he would take a treacherous, dangerous path through a desert area that had no water whatsoever, no oases whatsoever. And if he were to do this, this would place him in a surprise tactical advantage over the Romans. And so with 10,000 men, he marched through an area of the desert, I wish I could show you the, on the map, but in essence, basically, just like in the stories or in like the fairy tales or whatnot, he marched through with his men in a place where no man's land, nobody ever went there because there's no water. And it is said that for towards the end of that journey, the Sahaba ran out of water completely. And for two days, they did not have a single drop to drink, but they continued marching without water. This was at the very end of that journey, when they ran out of water for two days, they have nothing to do, no, no water, excuse me. And they marched through the blistering heat until finally they reached the oasis. And when they got there, he completely surprised the Roman flank. Completely unexpected. How could 10,000 men come from that area? And it was there, uh, along with the forces of Abu Ubaidah, that in Jumad al-Ula of the 13th year of the Hijrah, the most important battle in the Khilafah of Bakr al-Siddiq takes place. This battle is the most important battle. It is the battle of Ajnadain. The battle of Ajnadain. And the battle of Ajnadain, is the largest battle that has ever taken place as of yet between the Romans and the Muslims. Numbers are difficult to come by. Muslims, uh, the Muslim historians, they have a tendency to obviously, this is human nature, nothing wrong with that. You always do that uh, to exaggerate the enemy side. And so we have in the Islamic books, 80, 90,000 people uh, on the Roman side, and maybe you know, 10, 15,000 at max on the Muslim side. Um, most likely it was not 80, 90,000 people. Most likely it was maybe 30,000 or, or something of this nature on the Roman side. And on the Muslim side, maybe 10, maximum 13,000 from the Muslim side. But nonetheless, this battle is significant because it represents the first 
serious battle between the Romans and the uh, Muslims. And it was a resounding success. Especially with the coming of Khalid and the reinforcements, it was a success of an astronomical uh, level. And this success, it weakened the defense of the Romans and also their morale. And it allowed the Muslims to then march on to Damascus, Damishq. And therefore, in Jumada of the 13th year of the Hijrah, the Muslims surrounded that fortress of Roman pride and prestige, a city that goes back 6,000 years in human history. According to some people, Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited piece of land in the world today, according to some theories. It is one of the oldest civilizations that still people are living on that same place. Uh, and so uh, he surrounded Damascus in Jumada of the 13th year of the Hijrah and began a siege. You couldn't fight Damascus. Damascus had too big of a wall. The fortress or the, the, the city's defense was simply too much. You just had to siege. You just had to cut off the supplies and wait. And that's what Khalid and Walid did. And again, for reasons that are difficult to understand, why didn't the Romans send reinforcements? Why didn't other things happen? These are questions that are very difficult to have solid answers to from our perspective. Obviously, the answer is Allah Azza wa is helping them, okay? And especially realize the, the emperor's brother is in charge. Like, it's, it's not as if it's his blood brother is the one in charge, Theodore. He's the one in Damascus, right? surrounded by the, the, the Muslims. For whatever reason, Allah, of course, yani has his wisdom, and, and that is the ultimate reason. Uh, they were not able, the Romans were not able to break the siege. And so they decided they have no choice but to surrender. They have no choice but to surrender, and they asked for some conditions. Of them was that the soldiers be allowed to leave without being harmed, and etc., etc. And Khalid and Walid gave them all of their conditions. He all the conditions were basically given uh, to them, uh, and of course that the the churches be left. Well, obviously the standard conditions we would have given that anyway uh, to them, and so they demanded these things, and they got all of those uh, conditions. The one sad fact was that. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did not live to see this victory because he passed away in the final days of the siege of Damascus. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did not hear the good news. He simply heard the news of Damascus being surrounded. But Allah will that, and of course all of this is as well Bashara. It's a type of like premonition of the good that's going to happen. That in his lifetime, the most prestigious city of civilization at the time, perhaps after uh, Constantinople, maybe I should be honest here, Constantinople or Frank, Constantinople probably is the more prestigious, but still after that, Damascus definitely. So one of the most important bastions of civilization, within a year and a half after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the Muslims are surrounding it. And this bodes well for the future of Islam. It's an amazing display of strength, of optimism, and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu passed away, and the news of his death reached the Sahaba when they conquered the city. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did not hear of that conquering, and of course, the next, the biggest battle of all would take place very soon after, that is the battle of Yarmouk. The battle of Yarmouk, and of course, very shortly after, the biggest victory of all, and that is Jerusalem. But that will happen in the Khilafah of Umar ibn Khattab, not in the Khilafah of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Okay, so we're already getting to the issue of the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. In Jumad al-Akhirah of 13 AH, because Jumad al-Ula is when the siege began. It lasted for, did I say how long it lasted? One month. It lasted for one month. The siege of Damascus lasted for a little bit more than a month. So from Jumad al-Ula up until Jumad al-Thani, of the 13th year of the Hijrah was the siege. In Jumad al-Athani, Jumad al-Akhirah of 13 AH, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq fell sick. And the sickness only got worse and worse, and it was winter time, and the fever uh, made him even like burning hot and whatnot, and he became so sick, he felt that this is now my death is close by. He felt that I'm going to die now. He had never been this sick in his life, and he realized, or he had this premonition that this is my uh, maradul maut, this is the sickness of my uh, death. 
And he called a group of the Sahaba and he said to them that I feel, I, I, I think that I will be leaving you soon. And this illness will be my final illness. And so the covenant that you have over me shall be returned back onto you. Meaning this treaty of the Khilafah that I have with you, no, not the treaty, but the burden that I have will be lifted back and thrown back at you. Okay, we have this, this relationship. When I die, is going to be thrown back at you. And the pact that we have will be dissolved. And I think it is best if I choose somebody for you so that you don't differ amongst yourselves. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq himself thought of the idea, you know what, rather than wondering who's going to take over, I think it's best. So who do you advise I should choose? And he invited a small group of Sahaba, and they all said, we trust your judgment, Ya Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course I had said, his title was Khalifa to Rasulullah. He was not called Amir al muminin Everybody should know this simple fact of history. When Umar ibn al-Khattab became the Khalifa, uh, they first said, Ya Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasulullah, uh, that O Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Prophet And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, if we start this trend, then we're going to have a very long line. Khalifa to Khalifa to Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasulullah. And so uh, let's just change this and say the leader of the believers, Amir al muminin That shall be the way you address the, the ruler. So Abu Bakr was called Khalifa to Rasulullah. So they said, Ya Khalifa to Rasulullah, whoever you choose, we will be happy with. We trust your judgment and you decide. So he said, then let me think and let me uh, uh, choose who is best for the religion and who is best for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his religion and his servants. And for the next few days, he was sick for more than two weeks. For the next few days, he began to invite individual sahaba into his chamber of sickness, his bedchamber that he's about to pass away in. And... He specifically asked each and every one of them about Umar ibn al-Khattab. In other words, he's already made up his mind. He, he, nobody suggested to him Umar. He already had Umar in mind. And he was the one asking. And he invited Abdurrahman ibn Auf, one of the ten Ashara Mubashara. And he asked him, what do you think of Umar ibn al-Khattab? Tell me. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf demurred. He was shy. He said, you know better than I do, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And... Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, I insist you have to tell me your opinion about Umar ibn al-Khattab. And uh, he, he responded, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf responded, Wallahi, I think that he is even better than what you think of him. I think he's even better than what you think of him. And so he then invited Uthman ibn Affan. The same hesitancy. You know best, oh Khalifa al why are you asking me? He insists, I need to know your opinion. And Uthman ibn Affan said, Wallahi, my knowledge of him is that his private life is better than his public life. And that there is no one like him from amongst us. This is my opinion about him. That in private he's better than he is in public and there's no one like him amongst us. And Abu Bakr said to Uthman ibn Affan, Allah, may Allah have mercy on you. O Uthman, if I were to have skipped over him, I would not have gone beyond you. And this is already showing that Uthman is already in the minds of the other Sahaba. That you know, if it weren't for Umar, you would be the person I would choose. And of course, that's exactly what happened as well. And he invited other Sahaba as well. He invited Usaid ibn Hudayr. And he, uh, Usaid ibn Hudayr as well praised him and said, I know nothing of him except that he is the best of all Allah's servants and that you will not find anybody better than him to take over after you. And on and on and on. He invited Sa'id ibn Zayd, one of the ten, Ashra Mubashara. Anybody who was alive from the ten, he got invited. All of the Sahaba that he trusted got invited. He invited the leaders of the Ansar as well and got their opinion about Umar al-Khattab. And all of them unanimously agreed, but one Sahabi expressed one reservation, and that is Talha ibn Ubaidullah, who is also one of the great muhajirun, one of the elite of the Sahaba, Talha ibn Ubaidullah. He said that, Ya Khalifa Rasulullah, what will you say tomorrow in front of Allah? If Allah asks you why you placed the one who was so strict and harsh over the affairs of the Muslims. In other words, what he brought up was not a flaw of honesty, a flaw of... Uh, it was basically a character issue that 
an akhlaq issue, I should say, and that is Umar is very strict and harsh. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said to his servants and family, sit me up from the bed, sit me up. This is a big thing, I need to respond. So they sat him up and he said to Talha that do you bring me fear by asking me to think of Allah? In other words, and atukhawifuni billah means you are bringing the name of Allah and saying I have to answer to Allah on the day of judgment, then let me tell you what I think. That if Allah were to ask me, then I shall respond, Oh Allah, I place the best of them over them in charge of them. In other words, he is saying my conscience is clear that I will respond in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh Allah I chose the best of them and I could not think of anybody better than him to choose. And subhanAllah what this shows us is that you're never going to have 100% agreement about any tactic. I mean this is Abu Bakr, this is Umar. Not that Talha objected to Umar as a person but we all know Talha is correct in what he is saying that you know what there is an issue you need to think about that this particular person you're putting in charge has a reputation for being very harsh and strict and I'm worried Talha is basically saying that this is not going to be it might bring some issues okay so you're never gonna gain unanimous consensus even when Abu Bakr suggests Umar there's gonna be a little bit of, of, of whispering nonetheless you have to go with what is best and what not. And uh, Talha bin Ubaidullah, and by the way, Abu Bakr Siddiq also said to Talha, he said that his harshness is an overcompensation of my gentleness. Meaning what? Who can explain this? While Abu Bakr is Khalifa, I am being so gentle, so he is counterbalancing my softness. I'm too soft and I know it. And so what you presume, now this is amazing, he's defending Umar basically. He's defending Umar in his absence. And he's saying, you know, he's not that harsh. He's overcompensating for my softness. That's what he's telling Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And so when uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh asked all of the uh, yeah, the, the leaders of the Sahaba and pretty much there's Yunan, even Talha we cannot say he disagreed we simply say he's pointing out one issue and he got his answer Okay, so it is true to say that Umar ibn Khattab was appointed without a vote of dissent all positive, unanimous consensus that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq's choosing of Umar was unanimous amongst the Sahaba, the Muhajirun, and the Ansar. And so when this consensus was reached, he then called Umar ibn Khattab into his room and he informed him. Because he didn't call Umar until, I mean he's asked everybody else obviously, he's not going to ask Umar, you know, until the, the decision has been made. Once the decision is made, he then tells Umar ibn Khattab that I have chosen you to be my successor. And Umar, of course, objects. And he says, I cannot do this. Choose somebody else. And Abu Bakr then basically uh, pressures him, threatens him, cajoles him, until finally Umar ibn Khattab is pressured to accept the uh, Khilafah. And of course, this is exactly what we expect from a genuine leader. No leader embraces becoming a leader. Every leader is, has every genuine leader is hesitant because a genuine leader recognizes how difficult it is to be a leader and he has to be pressured and forced and this is in accordance with our Prophet Sallallahu the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, uh, hadith of Abu Dhar, Ya Abu Dhar, la tatlubanna al-imara, O Abu Dhar, do not seek to be the leader, because if you seek to be the leader, then the people will leave you and Allah will leave you. Rather, let the people come to you and ask you to be their leader, then in that case, if you want, accept the leadership. Okay, so the Islamic principle is that you do not show eagerness to be a leader. Not even show, you should not be eager to be a leader. It should not be something you desire. But if the people think you are the best, then pray istikhara and then put your trust in Allah. In one hadith, our Prophet said, if the people come to you, then Allah will be on your side. 
So when the people choose you, then that is a different thing. And this is what happened with Umar al-Khattab, that unanimously he was chosen to be the Khalifa after Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So now once this decision has been made, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq then dictated a document that was meant to be read uh, to all of the people in all of the cities and a portion of that document is that I have and uh, the, the, it begins with praising Allah and reminding them to fear Allah then he says I have appointed Umar ibn al-Khattab after me as your leader so you must hear and obey and realize that I did not spare any efforts nor did I prefer myself or my interest in this decision meaning I thought long and hard about this decision and I didn't choose my friends and my sons and my interests. I thought of the decision of the Ummah. So if he rules justly, well, this is what I assume of him. This is my opinion of him. And if he does other than that, then that is his sin and his responsibility. And I couldn't know ilm al ghaib In other words, he is basically giving you a blank, uh, if you like, uh, check of if you like I have nothing to do with sin I know that him he is a good man and if he is good to you this was my pr presumption of him suppose he were to change I can't predict the future and Allah knows the future and I couldn't have predicted this ilm al -ghayb. so again to the very end we see the uh, we see the, the, the humility of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the concern and care that he has. And it is also mentioned that during these last few days, he wanted to himself make this announcement. So uh, he managed to come to the masjid in his illness and address the people from the mimbar and tell them of his decision. And he then asked the Sahaba that, are you content? Are you happy with this decision? For wallahi, I thought as much as I could and I did not choose anybody who's near to me no relative of mine now Umar and Abu Bakr are not related at all they're like seventh eighth cousins right they're totally different tribes okay there's absolutely no direct of course they're both Qurashi but there's no I mean Abu Bakr has sons Abu Bakr has first cousins Abu Bakr has plenty of people in his own sub tribe but he is telling the people, I didn't choose somebody from my own tribe. I chose somebody whom I thought was the uh, best. And they said, we hear and we obey. We agree to your decision and we hear and we obey. And he placed Uthman ibn Affan as the coordinator, as the one who will take charge and, and make sure that Umar ibn Khattab basically has a smooth transition. And in this is a premonition that you're going to be next. Okay, so Uthman ibn Affan is a supervisor. That, you know, this transition is going to be smooth. You will make the announcements. You're going to make sure everybody gives the bay'ah to Umar. And so in appointing Uthman, one could say there is an indirect suggestion. And of course, it will play a natural role. It's not that Abu Bakr put the idea. Everybody had this idea that Uthman is fit for the Khilafah after Umar. And that's exactly what happened after the time of Umar ibn Khattab. And therefore, the people gave the oath of allegiance to Umar while Abu Bakr was still alive. While Abu Bakr was still alive, under the supervision of Uthman. And why did Abu Bakr do this? He himself said so. To avoid, Ali radiallahu anhu as well gave the oath. There was no, there was no hesitancy. There's nothing narrated in our books at all uh, about Ali radiallahu anhu uh, having any type of opposition. So, why did he do this? Because we said because he didn't want any ikhtilaf uh, taking place. And it is also narrated in uh, Ibn al-Jawzi's book, Sifat al-Safwa, that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq gave advice to Umar ibn al-Khattab. He gave some advice to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he said to Umar ibn al-Khattab that, O oh, Umar, always fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And realize that Allah is owed worship at night that cannot be given during the day. And Allah is owed worship at day that cannot be given during the night. This is a beautiful phrase. Beautiful phrase. In other words, you have to do certain things at night that you cannot do during the day. And of course the reference is to Hajjud. And you have to do things during the day that cannot be done during the night. And the reference here is to take care of the affairs of the Ummah. So don't procrastinate. Be busy, be proactive, worship Allah and do what you need to do as a servant of Allah. And remember that Allah will not accept a nafil until the fard have been done. Meaning look at your priorities. Don't jump to something that's a nafil until you do your priorities. And remember 
that when Allah has mentioned the people of Jannah, He mentions their good deeds and overlooks their bad deeds. So when you read about them, when you read the people of Jannah, then have some hope that uh, you will not be of those whose deeds have been overlooked. And when He mentions the people of Jahannam, Allah mentioned their bad deeds and He rejected their good deeds. So when you read about them, then be scared just in case you might be amongst them. And always be between fear and hope. In other words, never think that you're a man of Jannah and never think that you're safe from hell. Always have that hope and that fear. Always balance those two emotions out. Be humble enough that you want Jannah, but you're scared you're not going to get there. And you're hopeful you're not going to go to Jahannam, but you're scared you might go there. Right? So this is beautiful advice to Umar ibn Khattab from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. As we said, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, his fever lasted for two full weeks, or actually 15 days. And in the last of those days, he could not leave his house, and he was resigned to his bed. And Umar ibn Khattab took over uh, the uh, leading of the uh, prayer. And it is narrated that especially Uthman ibn Affan, so Uthman and Abu Bakr were very close uh, friends. Um, and of course, their personalities are also very you know, shy and whatnot. They were very close friends. Uthman was the one who visited him the most in his last days. And it is narrated that once Uthman said that when his fever got very bad, he said, shouldn't I call the healer, the tabib for you, right? And Abu Bakr said, the one who heals already has seen my situation. Meaning, he's not talking about the doctor, right? The one who heals has already seen my situation. He's already given me the verdict. And... It's already a done deal. And he has said that he does as he pleases. يَفْعَلُ ma يُرِيدُ He quoted the Qur'an. Allah does it. Now, of course, what he's saying is, I don't need a doctor. It's too late. I know this is the end. Okay? So the one who heals has already seen me, and he's already decided he's going to take me away. There's no need to call the uh, doctor. And uh, during his last days, he said to Aisha, uh, عنها, he said to her, uh, well, one of the things he said, he said, you are the most beloved of my family to me. You are the most beloved of my family to me. And also he said to her that, look at my wealth, calculate my wealth now, and see, what do I have now that I didn't have when I became the Khalifa? And get rid of that. In other words, when I entered the office, what have I gained? I don't, that's not something that is inheritable, it must be given away. And hand it over to Umar, the next Khalifa. So Aisha calculated, and lo and behold, he had one more servant and one more camel than when he entered office. Think about that. Like that's the extent of the quote-unquote wealth that he gained. One more camel and one more servant. So he said, this should be sent to Umar when I die. I should leave this dunya with the same amount that I came into this office. The office is not going to benefit me. And when he passed away, uh, the, the camel and the servant was given to Umar with the message that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, this is surplus that I didn't have it when I came in, so I don't deserve it. This is not my haq, it's the haq of the Khalifa. And you're the Khalifa, so you can take it. So when Umar al-Khattab was presented with this, he burst out into tears and he began sobbing uncontrollably. And he said, O oh Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, uh, you have made it very difficult for anyone after you. You have made it very difficult for anyone after you. You have made it very difficult for anyone after you. Meaning, how can I live up to this? How can I live up to this simplicity that he did not benefit at all from the position of Khilafah financially? He said, anything extra. You must just go to the, just go to the uh, the next uh, Khalifa, and his illness lasted on until Monday, the twenty second of Jumad al Akhira, which is typically corresponded to twenty second August six hundred and thirty four CE. So Monday, the twenty second of Jumad al Akhira, and it was Monday afternoon, and he said to Aisha, and he's in his fever in and out, and he said to Aisha. Which day did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam die? So Aisha said, Monday. So he said, Insha'Allah between now and tonight, I'll be gone. 
Inshallah, between now and tonight. Just a little bit left. In other words, his hope is, I'm going to follow the sunnah even on my death. I'm going to die on a Monday as well. Okay? So his hope is, from now until nightfall, will be it. And then he asked Aisha, what did you shroud him in? What was his kafan? And uh, Aisha says, in the famous hadith, hadith in Bukhari, this is the famous hadith of, of Aisha, we shrouded him in uh, three white Yemeni suhuli cloths. And Yemeni from Yemen, suhuli is a type of cloth that they had. So basically, three white Yemeni suhuli uh, cloths. There was no qamis. There was no qamis. It was a simple cloth. We all know the sunnah, at least of the, the, the burial, is a simple white cloth, right? You don't wear a shirt. You don't wear a thawb. You don't, well, you're allowed to if there's no other alternative. But otherwise, the asal is what? You have a clean sheet and you just wrap yourself in it. So this is what Aisha is saying, that we wrapped him in three Yemeni white suhuli uh, cloths uh, and there was no shirt and there was no uh, turban on it. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, look at that cloth of mine. So he's thinking which cloth? Look at that cloth of mine. It has some stains of saffron on it. It's an old cloth. Wash it, find two other cloths from that cabinet and bury me in those three. Aisha said, we have much better clothes, newer clothes to give you. We can give you those ones. Why do you want those old ones? And Abu Bakr Siddiq said, the living are more in need of such clothes than the dead. I don't need these brand new clothes. Give me the old stuff. Okay? The living need them more than the dead. And he ordered that his wife, Asma binti Umais, uh, wash his body. And that he be buried in the house of his daughter, Aisha, next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he passed away shortly after all of these wasiyas, indeed on a Monday, in the 20, on the 22nd of Jumad al-Akhirah, in the 13th year of the Hijrah. And he was reciting the verse uh, in the Quran, Tawaffani Musliman wa alhiqni bil salihin. Tawaffani Musliman wa alhiqni bil salihin. Cause me to die as a Muslim and resurrect me with the righteous. This is Surah Yusuf, verse 101. And the city was immersed in sadness, the likes of which they had not seen since the death of the Prophet. وسلم, and he was buried as he requested, right next to his companion in death as he was always next to him in life. And it was none other than Umar ibn al-Khattab who prayed the janazah, and Umar, and Uthman, and Talha, and his son Abdul Rahman were the four who went into the grave and lowered him next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam under the, the shoulder of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was not placed parallel to him, but rather he was lowered a little bit out of respect to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the head or the face of uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was parallel to the shoulder of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And SubhanAllah, he followed his sunnah in death, even as he followed in life because he passed away at the exact age that the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and that is 63 years old. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and may Allah azza wa jal reward him on behalf of the ummah for all that he has done, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us with him and with his companions on Judgment Day and in the hereafter. And with that, we finish the story of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and next week, insha'Allah ta'ala, we'll begin the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Any quick questions before we break for the salah? Yes? His wife, Asma binti Umais. His wife, Asma binti Umais. It is allowed for, uh, it is allowed for spouses to give ghusl to the spouse. It is allowed. And uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq felt more comfortable that his wife would do it rather than, rather than other people. And it is halal. Uh, the, the Prophet himself was joking with Aisha once. And he himself said well, in his deathbed, if you remember, we talked about this, that Aisha had a migraine. And she said, wa ra'sa, wa ra'sa. And the Prophet said, Rather, wa rather my head, oh my head. 
And then he said, what do you, what do you lose? If you were to die, even though we said he's going to die, but he's tra- cracking jokes with it to the very end. If you were to die, how fortunate would you be? I would do ghusl over you and pray over you and bury you. What more would you want? Right? And of course she responded, I'm sure you're looking forward to that day because then nobody's going to stop you from your other wives. Right? I'm the one preventing you from, from going to your other wives. But the point being, we, we, so we, we, we said that even the jokes of the Prophet are true. And this is a joke that he said to Aisha, but it is true. And he said, what would you be harmed if you were to die now? I would do ghusl and pray and bury you in the, uh, in the, in the qabr. So the fact that he said, I would do your ghusl, shows that it is halal for spouses to do ghusl. And this is what Abu Bakr Siddiq wanted, that Asma bint Umais. Of course, this is Asma bint Umais, the same Asma, who is, who was the wife of Ja'far, and then the wife of Ali. This is the same Asma bint Umais, who gave the, uh, the ghusl to uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala. Yes. Uh, I could not find uh, him calling Ali to the room. I could not find it specifically. But it simply says that after mentioning the names that I mentioned, and it simply says, and he called, you know, the rest of the, the Ahlul Halli Wal Aqt, which basically means the people in charge and, and, and whatnot. And so we can either assume that Ali was amongst them, or we can assume that he did not see it fit at this stage to. Uh, to to there there was no point to do that. Allah knows best. We don't know, you know. Yeah, but again, the age as well. We mentioned this multiple times that you need to take into account the age of Talha and the age of Abdurrahman bin Auf and the age and 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 again, there is a psychological factor as well that you know Abu Bakr radiAllahu an has seen Ali as a child and grown up in front of him. You cannot compare Abdurrahman ibn Auf for others, you know, to to Ali radiallahu anhu at the terms of just in terms of age wise. So no doubt other groups might have their way they read it in. And from our perspective, we trust Abu Bakr's judgment. If he called Ali, that also makes sense. And if he decided not to, there seems to be some some reasons as well that he wouldn't do that at this stage. And again, here's the point. Throughout Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman's Khilafah, Ali radiallahu anhu always played a major role. He was giving fatwas and he was a judge in the reign you know, by judge, I mean, obviously there wasn't an official position of judge at this early stage of Islam, but Ali was one of the few people who was acting as a judge. I.e. fatwas were given, uh, qada was done, so the fact that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is allowing him to be a judge, and he is doing so much in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, clearly there's the types of tensions that other groups raise simply did not exist in their time. Okay, inshallah with this we will conclude for today.